Hi, this is Privateer Station, and today we're bringing you day 211 of Ukraine-Russia war, done in the form of daily diaries between Alexei Rostovich, Lieutenant Colonel, advisor to the office of the President of Ukraine, and Mark Fagan, Russian opposition journalist. Enjoy! Dear friends, I'm glad to see you all on Fagin Live. It is Thursday, 22nd of September. It is 10 p.m. in Kyiv, and as usual, we're doing a stream with Alexei Rostovich. Good evening, Alexei. Good evening. This is day 211, and over 90,000 are watching us live. Over 15,000 of you clicked the like button. As we always ask, please uh, share links to that stream in your social media with your friends, people who need to see that. Click the like button and subscribe to Fagin Live to Alexei Rostovich in the description. And if you are watching that in English, subscribe to the Privateer Station as well. Do not forget to click that bell button to get uh, news of our new releases and more videos. We'll uh, get to the political stuff later. Let's start maybe with the situation on the front. Mark, not much is changing there. And I'm referring them first to them first. I think they're lying, but uh, let's see what uh, do the Russian forums talk about. Here's the map. Evil Russian public forums are disappointed with Russian command, and they're saying that Ukraine military reached Redkaduba and uh, Liman and some other parts are in in a kettle. Well, you know, we're not fully confirming until the general command releases data. And even if you imagine that they got uh, to Ritkadup, which is at about uh, 9 to the middle of the map, that would not be an encirclement. If they get to... if they get further, further east, then uh, perhaps we can talk about uh, encirclement. So what's the perspective of Liman? Oh, Liman is uh, pretty well... Um, we'll talk about that later. Okay, so what about Belogorovka, that uh, blue protrusion at the 6 o'clock of this map? See that blue part there? That means that we are successfully fighting and we are taking back territory and deoccupying it from... Putin's troops. Okay, then let's look at the southern front. Uh, stop on Donetsk as well. That is the only area where they still try to attack. The only condition they need to win, uh, absolutely need to win, is uh, creating uh, artillery overwhelming artillery wall of fire. They somehow managed to concentrate enough artillery in that direction. And um, they, do they have, again, those 45,000 shells daily? Uh, no, I'm a little bit exa exaggerating, but they are uh, basically repeating the same pattern. They have local artillery advantage, and this is the only part of the front where Russian troops are pushing us to the left. We, at the same time, are attacking in the two parts. We're attacking up north in Kharkov region and Lugansk and uh, Kherson. Now, down where Avdeevka and Marinka, they're a bit weak. They're tired. They threw their reinforcements uh, to Bakhmut and to Liman to support some sort of defense there. So they took away life from that direction. Not much in Zaporozhye happening, enemy is not attacking or storming our positions. On Kherson front, Kadyrov people are there now. Where are they? Well, they came a while ago, actually, because they were supposed to provide uh, help with referendum, with filtration procedures for prisoners. But yesterday they had a very unfortunate moment, um, because the building where they were staying in, about 70 of them got hit with several missiles and 40 of them went to the country of eternal hunting and 30 were transported expeditiously to to, to the hospitals. 
So this is basically an essence sour plan. We are grinding them out and uh, advancing. I think we'll be successful in short historic terms, not in two or three weeks. This is still a big group, but uh, in a rather short perspective. We also haven't talked about Suma and Chernika for a while. There is some artillery dueling happening there. They are shelling us a little, we're shelling them back. And that's what's happening on the front. So, in general, the situation is without any radical changes. Yeah, we've been uh, enjoying the success of Kharkov operation and we, where we ran for about 100 miles to the right. This was a rare success. Usually it's a bloody and slow grinding through each other's position, especially when you do not have overwhelming advantage over your enemy and uh, even when you do for example Russia has a big artillery advantage near Bakhmut but they just slowly grinding so okay another question we wanted to discuss at least what we see right now is happening in Russia in regards to mobilization and how can that reflect in the near future on the war theater on the east and on the south. We see quite a lot of videos where people are being sent to different military training camps from Khabarovsk, from Buratia, from Yakutia. At least uh, several dozens are on the video, maybe hundreds from each region, so they probably did gather enough uh, from different regions. And they are sending them to the front. What if they form, let's say, 10 more thousand and uh, send them to fight somewhere between Voronezhska and Luganska oblasts uh, up in the north and maybe down south to Kherson. How much can that affect the situation in the near future, let's say within a month? Well, it depends the condition they're being sent in. One would think they would be first sent to reinforce, reinforce uh, the usual military detachments that were worn out, if those detachments still have a commanding corps and they just get more sprinkled uh, randomly here and there of new draftees. So maybe that will minimize the rotation times for the troops they withdraw from the front. It will be difficult to gauge until that happens though, because it is difficult to estimate the efficiency of such a replenishment, because it causes uh, serious concerns about their battle worthiness. Why? Well, they're battle ready. They're not battle ready. Their battle readiness is nil. They need proper training. They have low motivation. They're being thrown on the front where nobody really tells them what is going on or, or trains them how to do that. Well, what can you tell looking at those videos? You've seen them, right? Of course, there are many people drunk. Um, people drink in Russia all the time. I've seen that. Um, what's uh, more important? Average age is uh, definitely closer to 40 or over 40. Uh, maybe it's easier to round them up. Maybe the ones who are younger run faster, I don't know. How useful can these people be on the front lines? Just want to understand. On one hand, we have some experience with Lugansk Mobics, who are wrangled and thrown into the fire. Why they're older? Because, yeah, the young youngsters run faster. And they're more mobile, they can leave the area, find ways to. The older they get, they usually get uh, more passive, they follow the laws and rules. Some of them may cherish uh, old USSR stuff and uh, somewhat support the idea, 
Young people would easily run to Kazakhstan or somewhere else. When the youngster faces a criminal penalty for his uh, avoidance of military service, he quickly runs to a different country and becomes anti-Putin activist there. But the older guys, they usually have families, they have mortgages, and that's why it's easier to get them. But in Lugansk and Donetsk, they also got to, uh, added to the detachments that were much higher motivated, and they've been fighting with us for eight wars. They have some ideological hatred and rather brainwashed, and um, they had a pretty good commanding corps, and they were showing rather good results. Some Lugansk mobilized people are fighting better than cadre Russian army. But, uh, oh yeah, you talked about that, that sounds strange. No, it's not strange. Also, they die in mass as well, and die more often, but um, this is not strange. They have been participating in the conflict uh, with our bordermen, uh, guardsmen all the time, so... The, the ones who have experience, that is, their experience is different. What uh, they had experience in where? Syria? Fighting with uh, Syrian uh, rebels? That's not uh, similar to fighting a big frontal war in Europe with tanks, artillery, airplanes and everything. So we don't see them going into the offensive. Um, they may try to repeat the same situation as in Bakhmut when they use seven batteries to attack one point. Um, and grind everything down there, and then they maybe have enough chance to push and capture a few more dozen yards. So we'll see. It's difficult to gauge at this point their actual battle readiness and how much change can they bring to the front. I'm a skeptic in this regard. I understand what it matters, what it means to create a working detachment. You need to make sure the platoon works, you make sure the all the lower detachment level works, and then all the way up to battalion, brigade levels, and proper proper making sure that proper functioning of that system takes at least two or three months. And one wonders how many days of training will they get. Again, not all of them will get to the battle stations on the front. Many of them will go to repair positions, logistics, servicing. There was a record one day. We had uh, volunteers from the central part of Russia who once ended up on the front in just three days after being mobilized. How many can they actually bring to the front, you think, in a month or so? Can they gather 50,000? Yeah, Mark, they probably can. But gathering 50,000 is not putting 50,000 fighters on the front. Okay, imagine the first wave uh, filled the, uh, the detachments on rotation. Okay, they put them there. What about the second part? They need more commanders, they need more equipment. Russian army had already used 70% of their warehoused equipment. And what, what is there is the worst. That maybe crawls, uh, if, even if they manage to start that and somehow get it to the front, it'll crawl for a few yards and die here. So they all will have very limited capacity. Maybe as a second group, second line to reinforce certain directions. Formally, they will have maybe enough people, but their battle worthiness will be very low. Maybe they can put 15, 20, 30 battalion groups from these mobilized people. They have a total about 110, 110 battalion groups here. Maybe they add another 30, so another third, roughly. But there are a lot of changing things in that formula, it's difficult to predict. I'm skeptical. One needs to really work, really work hard to make it work, to make military system work. It takes a lot of work for the officers to ensure the function. And that's when people help you, when logistics is poor, when you don't have enough ammo, when you don't have enough equipment, when you don't have lower level commanders. 
we saw some groups who are better motivated on the front, but usually if you have no time to train them and just throw them into the fight, in a week they'll be 30% less, they'll lose at least a third of their group. So I'm skeptical about their principal ability to influence the war theater. They will influence some things, yes, just by numbers, but uh, strategically I don't see how that affects anything. It's more interesting to see what will happen in Russia. I see some protests already. In Dagestan, from Buratia to Dagestan, people are starting to rebel against that. By the way, today at 7 p.m., were there any protests? Um, let's see. I think we'll, my tactics, we'll talk about that. Um, my tactics is different. We Let's talk about that daily and t uh, explain people their options. And uh, I'm, you know, my nerdy Jew style, I t keep suggesting people to subscribe. And the same thing I'll use upon our audience to entice them to come out. So, look, I have a thought. In Kherson, in two buildings, there were 70 Kadyrov people. Two missiles hit them, 40 dead, 30 wounded. They need to put them someplace, right? So there'll be more, exactly, there'll be more people in that same building, right? There'll be 200, 300, right? So add another one or two more missiles and the same proportion, hospital and dead. They come in, they settle, eight Heimers come say hi, they're gone. Doesn't matter if they were trained, if they were not trained more meat, it's easier to hit. So it is a really poor story on their side. I want to say another thing. Okay, please. I understood where is an ideal place for rebellion in Russia. It's in the Ukrainian Crimea. Look, their locals do support resentment to Ukraine. They do lean towards Ukraine. Russians think they are uh, pro-Russian, they're not. Then there are also Crimean Tatars who are against the regime. Also Crimea is a peninsula. We understand, right, that it's much easier if you rebel to defend that from uh, Russian troops. You just have a few bottleneck points. Uh, unlike any region in Russia where, you know, it's open from all sides. Also, General Hodges did make a statement that if Russia will use any unconventional weapons, uh, NATO will destroy Black Sea Fleet. So, you know, there is some support from NATO. And if you disagree with Putin's regime, you can just come to Crimea and protest here. We are nearby, NATO is nearby with their fleet and aviation, and they already promised to help. And it's easier to block the bridge. A lot of Ukrainians, a lot of Tatars, you can cause a lot of shenanigans in Crimea and rebel there. By the way, um, and you don't need to run to other countries like Mongolia or Finland. I have a question. Why are Russians fleeing to Finland? That is a NATO country, right? Putin was saying so much about NATO being such a threat. So why so many people are going in that direction? Uh, something is wrong here? Another news from Buynaksk. Um, more people are being rounded. A friend came back from the front. He is saying that official brigade uh, had 85% dead, 900 missing in action and uh, 1500 who refused to fight brigade is no more so and they're rounding more people and and more and more of that will happen these men will go through all the circles of hell they'll come drunk they'll get the initial roughening in a few days and then get dragged kicking and screaming to the front on the front, you have a big battalion, there is maybe 400 cadre remaining, commander, and uh, f several hundreds of you. It's night, Ukrainian are shelling you, um, there is nowhere to move, you need to dig in and hold the position, and at night Ukrainians on the radio are joking and suggesting you to surrender. And what are you doing there? 
there'll be how many days can you hold? On day five, you'll probably be pretty fed up with all that shelling and dying. And then you face the situation that there are four or five hundred of you and maybe a hundred of the core remaining troops. Uh, you're all armed, so I wonder how long will it take until one of these detachments starts rebelling. I already saw some people burning draft points in Russia, but my suggestion is it's much easier to rebel when you are given a weapon. So rebelling on the front is much easier. Also, I have a special message from Ukrainian command. The moment you start rebelling, we stop shelling you. When you are rebelling, we're not shooting at you. When you're not rebelling, we are. If you don't want HIMARS, go rebel. If you are okay with getting high marks on your head, uh, yeah, you can continue fighting. Moreover, if we see other detachments coming to suppress you, we'll help you to rebel, we'll hit uh, them with our high marks. So, something to think about. I don't know how many of those 436,000 watching us are planning to rebel, but 110,000 click the like button. Maybe at least they will consider that option. I still suggest to share links in your social media and with friends, and especially with those being drafted. My other question is, with such a mass, you still need some second line of protection to make sure they are predictably staying on the front. Because they're not quite predictable in their behavior. There are some videos now that still have a lot of uh, idiots drinking and cheering and saying, yay, we're going to Ukraine to win. So I think they haven't realized where they're going to yet. I just remembered a movie Parade of Planets uh, by Abdur Shitov. It's a genius movie, right? It's about something else, but uh, you know that feeling of those guys who had fun in the village uh, disco, they uh, had some fun night with girls, and they're also amazed at the big astronomical event happening, and they're just uh, all that festivity in their eyes and drunk festivity, that's what kind of I see in some of the eyes of these people. Yeah, what I wanted to say about that is that uh, unfortunately most of you who, will not, who are coming to the front now will not be able to learn to distinguish the difference between incoming shell from mortar, from 150 artillery, or from HIMARS, because everything happens is so fast. You just can't imagine how fast things unfold there. The first uh, impression with anybody I talk to, even my own experience, how fast everything happens. We're talking and then boom, five seconds, and there's just bodies around you and smoke, and you don't realize how you are alive. Not even five seconds, maybe one or two. It's a moment. Boom. And the person you are talking to is dead and not just him. And maybe you're dead too. Depends upon your luck. So that story, that story is, uh, yeah, they're kind of like in the movie. They don't understand this is a 21st century war and such a big number of losses is mostly explained by the use of modern armaments modern technology. One needs to understand that something that used to kill one is uh, has been upgraded and now it can kill a hundred. You know, several booms in the air and most people of who's coming to you with you from Perm are not alive. A few bullets, a few shrapnels, and yeah, all of a sudden there are very few of you left. So these blocking troops, they'll need them, they'll, they'll need some troops to prevent retreat. So fighting war is not a lollipop. Do you think Kadyrov people will be enough to do such a function, to perform that? Or they will need to create a full-bodied, like, military police, or they'll pretend and call it something else? Somebody needs to protect them, and they'll probably use some of those uh, pseudo-legal things they adopted right before the war. Mark, you know what Putin did at the beginning of this mobilization? He entered the zone where his... Uh, Generals are telling him, Vladimir, we are in a zone where we cannot predict how things will unfold. Too many unknowns. Also, 
protest potential, nobody can engage. You cannot socially acquire people about their rebelling. You cannot also predict that with your people being sent to the front. So they don't know. And neither do we. But I want to say that if there will be rebellion happening with uh, battle detachments on the front line, they will have no resources to try to calm them down. Now again, you're sending 150,000. How many people do you need to cover them on the backside to make sure they do not retreat? Right, so they need, what, 20,000? Yeah, I think maybe maybe that's their logic. 150,000 of the drafted go to the front, another 150 are behind, preventing their retreat, and then after some time they change places. That's, yeah, uh, dark humor. And again, what is that uh, guarding detachment? For example, you have a tank regiment uh, rebelling. They got tanks, machine guns, uh, artillery, and then uh, what? Uh, police comes with uh, armored vehicles. Good luck stopping the tanks. You know, the ones uh, trying to force them to fight will be much weaker equipped than the ones on the front. Plus, uh, you know, after fighting a bit on the front, those people who have been there, they get enough uh, guts and uh, smarts to overwhelm their uh, prisoners. And we had a running joke here in Ukraine that after, you know, when Kharkov uh, offensive happened uh, and we reclaimed the territory, we were joking that yeah, Russian news said that after continuous fighting, Russian troops managed to overcome the resistance of Kadyrov uh, guarding units and starting an advancement to the east. So I do not believe that these troops will just quietly come here and die en masse. I am waiting for them to start rebelling. Remember 1917 when Bolsheviks and SRs, uh, the other group that was against fighting, they, as a punishment, the rebels were sent to the army. So they came to the army and they were propagandizing there. And in just a few months, the troops decided to stop fighting. So what are they doing now with people being round up? They're giving them notes to come to the gathering point, right? So give them a few days and uh, on the front and we'll see what happens. What else do you do? Like uh, even the battalion rebels, how can they stop that? What, come and kill everybody? Okay, we'll say thank you. There'll be, there are two Russian detachments killing each other. We'll wait. But in fact, uh, as I said, we'll help that battalion to shoot the ones who are shooting at them from the Russian side. And then tell me what will happen with uh, that policing unit. They do not have much uh, bright perspectives of survival in their functions. And there'll be a lot of interesting things in the front, I think. Um, there'll probably be more adventures, uh, interesting news coming out from the training camps. This is the area of unknown possibilities. This uh, one thing I can say, uh, this does not affect our plans. Neither referendum nor mobilization. Of course, we do not want, uh, we would try to avoid killing unnecessary and those who don't want to fight uh, here and kill Ukrainians uh, rebel, uh, change sides, find ways. We addressed that earlier and we'll help you. Okay, we have over 470,000 people watching us live. Let's talk about the exchange. That is one of the hot topic that I was saving for the end of the show. But I'm ready to discuss it now. Imagine that, Mark. I knew about all that yesterday and I had to keep a poker face throughout the show and not talk about it. Yep, I know. Um, okay, let's talk about it now. Some people in Russia were commenting a lot about that event and the Russian forums, um, that the exchange of Medvedchuk, relative of Putin, for Azov people and other Ukraine war fighters um, happened in a very inopportune moment for that mobilization announcement. Do you think it was spontaneous? Do you think it happened uh, just like that? It was not spontaneous. It was a long process. There are a lot of special services from our Ministry of Defense, uh, probably Intel, 
our diplomats, of course, uh, special services of other countries involved. Geographically, you can understand where the exchanges were done, so those countries partook in that. And the worst of those conspiracy theories that Zelensky gave Azov Steel defenders to Putin for not, and his aide Yermak was helping him with uh, being an agent and all that. Um, so that totally crumbled. <coughs> and the exchange was uh, done. What I was amazed was the timing and the fact itself that they actually gave us those steel people um, because the exchange at the day of mobilization that is yeah the prob probably the biggest hit on mobilization effort because uh, imagine you're going to the screen telling people we are fighting those imaginary nazis everybody to the front and at the same day, he basically exchanged some of those, uh, as you claimed, the evil, the vilest of those Nazis, and exchanged them for one of your buddies. Um, we have a few theories. Um, it's very poor coordination, right? So these two events, I don't know. Is it Putin who is making these decisions? Is he even alive? Is uh, who is picking up the phone when foreign dignitaries are calling Kremlin? We have no idea, right? Uh, the other version is maybe Putin is a spy, Chinese, American, Martian, you pick. But definitely he's not pro-Russia. Um, the third one actually got suggested by one of the radio hosts in Israel. He brought up a question. Look, Alexei, he wants peace, right? He wants negotiations. He came to Erdogan to ask for negotiations and help in that. If all that, if we follow the theory that all that mobilization is raising stakes to get to the table, and Erdogan re responded, "How can I help you if uh, I promised to help as hostile people, and you failed in helping me realize my promise? You know, give them back to Ukraine, and maybe I have." Uh, Additional point, as a person who kept his word, it's important here, and uh, I'm a man of my word, and I can talk and, you know, impress that on people to see if we can get to the table, because you promised me one thing, and then you captured them and held them there, and then uh, just killed some in Yelenovka. So if you do something like that, that'll help me to talk in your favor about the negotiations. So when I listened to heard that theory, that is impressive. That has, uh, I think, a lot of truth to that, probably. But I'm not canceling the first two. Because, you know, exchange is important, but doing that on the day of announcing your fight against Ukraine and mobilization, um, yeah, I think it just coincidence, but that is an insane coincidence. Indeed, yeah, it does look like a loss of command. Left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. Whoever was doing the exchange probably didn't know about the speech on mobilization. You know, exchange is done, is guided by Putin, nobody else will do that. So, what do we have there? There is no one person, there is no Putin. Who represents Russia on the international arena, who has that nuclear button? What the heck is happening there? I don't know. This is a rather radical version. But the relation of Medvedchuk and at least five, no, uh, we actually exchanged 215 for 55. So we got uh, 128 officers of Azov Steel. We'll pick uh, everybody else later. We, it doesn't mean that we stop that effort. We, of course, continuing that effort. How do you think they... It, it even happened, right? So I have a question. Is Medvedchuk pricey? Is, is he important for us? No, not for you, for Putin. Because for us, we asked him everything. Oh, yeah, we asked him everything and he talked. He tweeted till the cows came home. He gave so much data 
uh, we took quite a few agents uh, based on, on his words. Oh, so he's a rat. Yeah, right, reminds me of a joke. Uh, browser asking, can you, are, are you going, are you, are you okay with sending data to developers about the faulty work of this browser? The user clicks yes, the browser responds, damn, you're a rat. So, yeah, Medvedchuk, uh, he's empty now. He talked about everything he knew. We took everything from him, all his Putin's riches that he had in Ukraine, and he was sent back, probably in his underwear. And I strongly suspect he is now being questioned by very similar people, uh, somewhat counterpart agency on the Russian side, and asking very similar questions, where, where's the money, man? So was he answering? Was he answering the questions that uh, Ukraine was asking? Awesome. Yeah, he did. Uh, he did that in writing and we have the records and videos and all that. Beautiful. Then somebody somebody needs to be very concerned. Wonderful. We've been 35 minutes live and we'll return to the topic of exchange. It is an important, big subject. There'll be more exchanges, I suspect. We'll continue, right? Yes, we'll continue. This is an important topic. For now, we don't know too much about protests, groups organizing stuff in Russia. So, there are several. One of them is trying to organize urbanized hipsters, students, uh, girls. I can't watch those videos. They It's just police beating them up. Our task is to get the other ones on the rise. The guys who are hitting and drinking as they walk. These are the ones who need to start showing up. They need to start showing up with their wives, with their women, to the local administrations. Big adult guys uh, coming to the administration and talking to the administration, saying, hey, we do not agree. Talk to us, we need to discuss a few things. Yeah, because local heads of administration were given a task to do the conscription, to do the draft, and that's the people you need to talk to them. You need to come to your regional, don't go to your town administration, go to the regional administrations. If whatever administration you have of a higher caliber, go to that one and take your relatives and bring them with you. This is the only way for you to demand something from the local power. If you're just going to the squares, which is also good, some protest groups are calling for that, but that is not enough. Just walking to the square is one thing. Every day, whatever matters, you after work at 7 p.m., you come there, first of all, you'll meet more people like you near that administration will provide aggregation and communication from this channel and you'll be coming there and they are taking people to the front daily yeah, they'll be taking them to the front daily so for you i suggest you gather next to that administration building in front of that power and at some point there'll be a lot of you at some point you'll enter that building and at some point you will become power you need to blockade administrations listen to the participant of two maidans of two ukraine revolutions all that story with a scary and strong and horrible and suppressing power is so until you decide to kick the first door that power topples so quickly you can't even imagine the speed with which it topples. You, huge Siberian man, Ural man, or also Petersburg and Moscow, for you to topple that power is maybe 15 minutes. You gathered a big enough group, enter through the doors. Those policemen, maybe one or two who are there on the first floor, they won't even resist. They likely change the colors and put your own ribbons on them or flee. Found the one who's uh, in power in charge there and took him downstairs and let him out of the building and take take it over. And then you gather people, put more barricades, make sure you hold the building, get the groups organized, work with uh, military, they're your neighbors, work and talk to them so they do not participate on the opposite side, talk to your local police who also lives next door to you, and just make sure military are blocked, in, or if they don't want to participate, block them in their detachments, and they usually do not interfere, they're waiting for police to figure it out. 
by the time Moscow decides to send somebody, you guys will own the whole region. And if there'll be another regions, one, two or three rebelling, they'll have no chance of quelling you down. Uh, maybe if uh, just one, yeah, they can concentrate all the country effort on that. But if there are several, there is no way to stop you. And after after you take that, you are the power. You can't imagine how easy it is to become to, to take power from whoever runs it now, because it's so much easier to do that than die here on the front, and it's more honorable. And there'll be people in the world supporting you, there'll be other countries recognizing your independence. You know, Germany already announced they'll be taking men who are refugees from mobilization. So the moment you do that, the moment you take your region back, Putin's regime will topple in two or three days. Trust me as a person who went through that a couple times. It happens momentarily. The only thing is when it's repression and you're hitting, being hit too hard, is when you're indecisive, is when you're not deciding to kick that door. The first stone in that administration window, and you're one, if you support that person. This is a chain reaction, it's just like a wildfire. And uh, all of a sudden the suppressive power is gone. How many of those bureaucrats are in the administrative building? 150? 100 of them are accountants and supporting personnel? You won't even see them, uh, Alexei. They won't even see the heads there. They'll probably run flee before that. Exactly. You'll just occupy the empty building. So every day, come to your administration, start asking questions. If you'll be showing up there daily, all of a sudden you'll find out there are a lot of you, and there are so many of you that there is nothing can be done about you. And you can start talking about different things. We need guarantees, we need to figure out about payments, started talking, one, two, more questions, then, you know, push him aside, enter the building, it's yours. All right, we've been live for about 42 minutes. We have a stream tomorrow, right? Friday? Yes, we do. All right, Friday, we continue that topic, and we'll be talking about it daily, get ready, about the actions you can take to resist the regime. And I remind you, 7 p.m., any building, any, any town, any capital, any place where you live, come alone, maybe tomorrow will be two, maybe next day will be three, maybe four, eventually there'll be a hundred and more of you. And you don't even need to do anything, just come there, just come and talk to them. And I want to say one more thing, men and women, you can't even imagine how much power you have. Rebelling people, there is nothing that can be done against rebelling people. And the history of Russia is filled with cases when power was blown away very quickly and toppled. You do remember who you are, there are some bloods in you from Pugachev, from Razin, from Cossacks. Why you want to die for that balding idiot in Kremlin? Mobilization in Russia, right, in the last hundred something years happened only three times. What existential threat is there for mobilization to happen? NATO? Why are you fleeing, why are you fleeing to NATO in millions? So Ukraine never wanted anything from you. We never attacked you, we never wanted to anything on your side. This is just a threat in the head of one hemorrhoidal Cretan in Kremlin, who killed so many people already, who is eager to send hundreds, thousands more to their deaths and is threatening the world with nukes? Do you want your relatives to die in return nuke fire? Or do you want you yourself die in Ukraine fields somewhere 5,000 kilometers from your town, somewhere near Kherson that you cannot even find on the map? And you're dying there to protect his ass that uh, he's afraid for? So you make a choice between 300,000 of your lives or one gnarly ass of an old dude in Kremlin. If you want to take power, you will take power. And the choice is simple. You, you, your choice is real. It's either you dying on the front or that, that bureaucrat being pushed away. You don't even need to kill them, he'll run. He'll lose the pants on the way because there is nothing they can do against 500, 1,000, 40 year old men who know their stuff and who, want, who know what they want. You are the real 
power of Russia. Can you just... Uh, do you think you can resist? Do you think you can take over? Or do you want to be like sheep going to the front today? And we'll support you. All right, we'll return to that tomorrow. We'll be sending appeals to you daily. I hope we can wake people up. Please share links, share that with uh, those who needs to see that. Click the like button, subscribe to Fagin Live, Alexei Rostovich, and if you are listening or watching to that in English, subscribe to the Privateer Station. See you at 10 p.m. tomorrow. Alexei, see you tomorrow. I do believe in Russian men.